Some people are born to perform. They just have it in their blood. Mickey Rooney was one such person who took to acting like a duck takes to water. From the time that he was a child to the year he passed away, Mickey Rooney gave some truly unforgettable performances. In this video, Joe and I are going to show you how important Mickey's impact on Hollywood was and how his peers viewed him. If you're new to the channel, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Also, support us on Patreon. All links are down below. So, without further ado, please enjoy this look into one of the most talented actors to ever grace the silver screen, Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney was born Ninian Joseph Yule Jr. on September 23, 1920 in New York City. Coming from an acting family, his mother, Nellie W. Carter, was a former chorus girl and burlesque dancer, while his father, Joe Yule, performed on vaudeville. His parents' career actually intertwined with his birth, as Mickey was born while his parents were a part of a Brooklyn stage production called A Gaiety Girl. Unfortunately, Mickey's parents would split when he was only four years old, with his mother moving them both to Hollywood the next year. After arriving in Hollywood, Nellie decided to bring her son into the family business. After appearing in the 1926 silent short, Not To Be Trusted, Ninian would get the role of Mickey McGuire in a series of short films. He would adopt the Mickey name for the remainder of his career. Mickey would perform in these short films from 1927 to 1936, during which time he would get the opportunity to appear in several classic films, such as The Beast of the City, The Life of Jimmy Dolan, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and he even voiced Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Following A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1935, Mickey Rooney would sign with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer where he found his greatest success and met a young actress who would become one of his closest friends, Judy Garland. One of Mickey's first big hits at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer was the 1936 film, The Devil is a Sissy. He would co-star alongside fellow MGM child actors, Jackie Cooper and Freddie Bartholomew. These three were not only some of the biggest child stars in Hollywood at the time, but some of the biggest names overall. Both Jackie Cooper and Freddie Bartholomew have both raved about Mickey Rooney's talent, and I want to share that with a clip from the 1992 television documentary and the film that inspired me to study film history, MGM, When the Lion Roars. Listen, what kind of a lookout are you? Swell lookout you, man. Yeah. I don't want to be a lookout. Besides, you'll never get $80 that way. Well, what you got that's better, smart guy? Why, well, that's quite simple. Oh, it is. Yes, but I don't steal from the poor. I steal from the rich, like Mr. Raffles. Raffles? What mob did he run with? He didn't have to have a mob. He was a lone wolf. Huh. Yes. Now, the idea is, is to steal things that boys like us can dispose of without suspicion. Like what? Well, like poison things. Should we go down to the hideout and make our plans? When we went to make this picture, uh, The Devil is a Sissy was the name of it, Mickey had a couple of scenes in it that Freddie and I were in, and I looked and didn't know that when you were this young, you could act this good. Get to read the paper this morning? No, I didn't. The old man's always doping the horses. Hey, it's Grandma there, you kid. You didn't read what my old man said, huh? No, I didn't. Squealer got it first. My old man said, wipe off that chair. A rat just got through sitting in it. Boy, he was plenty tough. I'll say he was tough. You know how long he was in the chair? How long? Nine minutes. You know how many jolts it took to finish him? Four jolts of more than 2,000 volts. Gosh, that's more electricity than it takes to run this streetcar. Mickey was uh, an incredible talent, but a little wild, a little undisciplined as a performer. He never took anything seriously. Everything was happy-go-lucky. I will say this, though, about Mickey. Of the whole group of us, my personal opinion, that he was the very best actor of the group. He could do anything tear your heart out, make you laugh, sing, dance, juggle, 
play any instrument you could name. Judge Hardy, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> to this day, I have a feeling of awe about his talent. Judge Hardy, a surprise. Well, what's this all about? In 1937, Mickey Rooney was cast in his most famous role, that of Andy Hardy in A Family Affair. Originally, the film was meant to be a B-movie, but it became such a huge success that MGM decided to make a series of films featuring the Hardy family. Mickey would become the breakout star of the film, playing Andy Hardy in all 15 films from 1937 to 1958. Many felt that the world of Andy Hardy was the kind of childhood MGM head Louis B. Mayer never knew, but wished he had. In fact, he made sure that the series showed an idealized version of America that would suit it for the times. Mickey Rooney's success would often go to his head, and as a teenager at this point, he was beginning to become more like Andy Hardy, overly animated and crazy about girls. This prompted L.B. Mayer to step in and act as a father figure to Mickey, even if his parenting style left much to be desired. Film historian Jane Ellen Wayne put it best when she wrote, and I quote, Mayer naturally tried to keep all his child actors in line, like any father figure. After one such episode, Mickey Rooney replied, I won't do it, you're asking the impossible. Mayer then grabbed the young Rooney by his lapels and said, Listen to me, I don't care what you do in private, just don't do it in public. In public, behave. Your fans expect it. You're Andy Hardy. You're the United States. You're the Stars and Stripes. Behave yourself. You're a symbol. Mickey nodded. I'll be good, Mr. Mayor. I promise you that. Mayor let go of his lapels. All right, he said. While this may seem over the top, Mickey would later comment on Mayor's treatment by saying, Everybody butted heads with him, but he listened, and you listened and then you'd come to an agreement you could both live with. He visited the sets, he gave people talks. What he wanted was something that was American, presented in a cosmopolitan manner." Unquote. During his Andy Hardy years, Mickey Rooney would also appear in a number of films with his closest friend, and in my personal opinion, the secret love of his life, Judy Garland. Their first film together was Thoroughbreds Don't Cry, the chemistry between them was incredible, and they were paired together in not only three Andy Hardy films, but also Babes in Arms, Strike Up the Band, Babes on Broadway, and Girl Crazy. Mickey describes his relationship with Judy Garland in this next clip. Enjoy. When Judy and I were so close we could have come from the same womb. Yeah, we weren't like brothers and sisters, but there was no love affair there. There was more than a love affair. It's very, very difficult to explain the depth of our love for each other. It was so special. It was a forever love. Judy, as we speak right now, has not passed away. She's always with me in every heartbeat of my body. In 1939, Mickey Rooney was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in Babes in Arms. That same year, he and fellow child star Deanna Durbin were both awarded the Academy Juvenile Awards for significant contribution in bringing to the screen the spirit and personification of youth. The year prior to this, Mickey would star alongside Spencer Tracy in Boys Town, which told the true story of Father Edward J. Flanagan, who founded a home for delinquent boys to turn their lives around and become respectable members of society. The two worked very well together, so much so that Louis B. Mayer said that Boys Town was his favorite film during his 27 years at MGM. 
the young star's popularity continued to grow more and more, even becoming the biggest box office draw from 1939 through 1941. Legendary actor Laurence Olivier even said Mickey was the greatest actor of them all. Olivier's opinion was felt by many, as Mickey Rooney continued his success in films like Young Tom Edison, A Yank at Eaton, and The Human Comedy. The Human Comedy features Mickey as a young man named Homer McCauley, whose older brother Marcus has been fighting overseas during World War II. This film was one of many the studios of Hollywood made to promote the war effort and the effects the conflict had back home in the States. Van Johnson describes one particular scene in this film that brought audiences to tears. Take a look. I may be killed in this war. I must come right out and tell you this. I think Mickey Rooney is one of the most talented men in the business. And he did one scene where uh, I'm off at war. And I wrote this letter home to my mother, who was played by Faye Bainter. And Mickey worked in the telegraph office with Frank Morgan, who was always asleep on the telegraph thing because he was drinking. And Mickey read this uh, letter that I wrote. And I just think it tore everybody to pieces. I shall always be watching you. You are what we are fighting the war for. Yes, you, my brother. I miss you very much, boy. I can't wait till I see you again. When we meet, I will let you wrestle and put me down on my back in the parlor. In front of Ma and Bess and Ulysses. And maybe Mary even. I will be so glad to see you. God bless you. So long, boy. Your brother Marcus. My brother's killed in this war. I'll spit at the world. I'll hate it forever. I'll be good, I'll be bad. I'll be the worst there is. I'll be the worst that ever lived. The Human Comedy saw Mickey be nominated for his second Academy Award. He followed this with films like National Velvet, which made a star out of a young Elizabeth Taylor. However, the film came out in 1944, the same year a now adult Mickey Rooney was inducted into the United States Army. Unlike other stars who joined to be directly involved in the war, like James Stewart and Clark Gable, Mickey's job was to entertain the troops at USO shows and in combat areas. The troops loved him as the young star brought his infectious energy to those who were so far away from their families. For 21 months, Mickey spent his time on the radio on the American Forces Network and traveling throughout the United States and Europe as part of the military's special services branch, which was designated specifically for entertainment. For his contributions to the war effort, Mickey Rooney was awarded the Bronze Star Medal, the Army Good Conduct Medal, the American Campaign Medal, the European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. Upon returning home after the war, Mickey Rooney entered a period in his career where he wasn't getting the same quality roles he was used to. Given that he didn't have the stature of most of Hollywood's leading men, he struggled for quite a while. By the end of the 1950s, he had left Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and tried his hand at the new medium of television. He had his own series called The Mickey Rooney Show, but it only lasted for 32 episodes. The 1960s saw a bit of a resurgence with films like Requiem for a Heavyweight, and it's a mad, 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 mad world. However, it was in 1961 that saw Mickey get a lot of attention for all of the wrong reasons. Author Truman Capote's novella, Breakfast at Tiffany's, was given a film version in 1961, casting Audrey Hepburn as Holly Golighty 
and Nikki Rooney as her Japanese landlord, Mr. Yuniyoshi. This would be the biggest misstep of his career. Not only did director Blake Edwards not consider an actual Japanese actor for the role, he wanted Mickey to be over the top with his mannerisms, which amounted to nothing more than a racist caricature of Asian people. In my opinion, Mickey should have known better and refused the role, but growing up in comedies, I guess he felt it would be okay. As anyone can imagine, there was considerable backlash for his portrayal of Mr. Yuniyoshi. One of the producers of the film, Richard Shepard, said that he wanted to recast the role because he felt the role should be played by an actual Japanese actor. Even director Blake Edwards came to regret his decision. He said, and I quote, Looking back, I wish I had never done it, and I would give anything to be able to recast it. But it's there, and onward and upward, unquote. As per Mickey Rooney, in 2008, he said in an interview, It breaks my heart. Blake Edwards wanted me to do it because he was a comedy director. They hired me to do this overboard, and we had fun doing it. Never in all the more than 40 years after we made it, not one complaint. Every place I've gone in the world, people say, God, you were so funny. Asians and Chinese come up to me and say, Nikki, you were out of this world. Due to the backlash the film got since its initial release, Mickey said that if he knew his performance would be offensive, he wouldn't have done it. But as I said earlier, Mickey should have known better. Although his quote surprised me when he said that there were some Asian people who liked what he did, I'm in no position to judge, but at the end of the day, yellowface as well as blackface is unacceptable and should never be done. Deep down, I think Mickey Rooney understood that. When his career slowed down during the 50s and 60s, Mickey was able to find new fans on television. As we saw earlier, he had his own television series which didn't pan out. However, one guest appearance on Selenese Theater led to numerous guest appearances on many other shows like Playhouse 90, Wagon Train, General Electric Theater, Burke's Law, The Love Boat, and The Golden Girls. In 1981, Mickey Rooney appeared in the television movie Bill. His role as a mentally handicapped man who attempts to live on his own after leaving an institution earned him both a Golden Globe and an Emmy Award. He reprised the role two years later in Bill on His Own and earned another Emmy nomination. Mickey Rooney never forgot his stage roots. On Broadway, he performed alongside his former MGM contract player Ann Miller in Sugar Babies, a musical review tribute to burlesque. Not only, it, not only was it hugely successful, but Mickey would be nominated for both a Tony Award and a Drama Desk Award. In its final years, Mickey was able to entertain a new generation of fans in the 2006 comedy Night at the Museum, alongside Ben Stiller, Dick Van Dyke, Bill Cobbs, Carlo Gugino, and Robin Williams. In 2011, he made a cameo in The Muppets during the opening musical number. One of the last significant things Mickey Rooney did during his life was in 2011, when he spoke before a special U.S. Senate committee about the issue of elder abuse, which he himself claimed to be a victim of. He had gotten a restraining order against his stepson, Christopher Aber, and Aber's wife, Christina. He claimed that not only were they abusing him, but that his stepson, whom he entrusted with his finances, wasted millions of dollars on a lavish lifestyle for himself. Despite all of this, he always had a smile on his face whenever he met fans. On April 6, 2014, Mickey Rooney died of natural causes at the age of 93. He left behind an incredible legacy of film, television, and stage work. He was married eight times and had nine children. His final film appearances included a cameo in Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb, released in 2014, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, released in 2017. Before we end this video, Joe and I want to show you his acceptance speech at the 1983 Academy Awards, 
where Mickey Rooney was awarded with an honorary Oscar in recognition of his lifetime achievement. Enjoy. The Board of Governors, in its delightful wisdom, has voted this honorary Oscar to the kid who eliminated all our yesterdays and to the man who brightens all our todays. To you, Mick, with love. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Academy, this is for 60 years of work, so they tell me. It's really only for six minutes of fun, of love and joy, of working with, playing with, like children, the people that we all are on the screen. I love every minute that God has given me to be an infinitesimal small part of this great business. Sixty years, gosh, I. Tonight, for my being here, and the responsibility really belongs to somebody that I, I'd love to put my arms around, like Judy Garland and Louis Stone, Faye Holden, Spencer Tracy, Wallace Beery. Memories. I have a lot of memories, as we all do. When I was 19 years old, I was the number one star of the world for two years. When I was 40, nobody wanted me. I couldn't get a job. And then a professor from the University of Tennessee got a show together with Terry Allen Kramer and Harry Rigby called Sugar Babies. And it resurrected my career. Last year, God smiled upon me, and I was given the Emmy for Bill, and I won the Peabody Award and the Golden Globe, and tonight you honor me beyond anything that a man should be given. You honor me with the greatest and the highest tribute we can receive in our business. My family all love you, and they're all tingling inside because of this moment for me. I'd love to even kiss Louis B. Mayer. <laughs> but it's, it's wonderful. The woman who put it all together was Ruth Webb, my agent who, who picked out the pieces, picked up the pieces and put them back together. Mickey Jr., Timmy, Teddy, Kelly, Carrie, Kyle, Kimmy Sue, Jimmy Jonell, Chris and Mark and my grandchildren, <laughs> the, my grandchildren, Shannon and Nika, they're home tonight looking and saying, that's granddaddy up there, and he's got the Oscar. But the one that's responsible outside of God is my wife, Jan, who kept saying to me for the last seven years, I know you can do it, Mick. Get up off the canvas. You can do it. I want to thank you one and all for remembering me. Thank you for this glorious moment. God bless and good night. We hope you've enjoyed today's video about one of the greatest stars of all time. If you enjoyed what you saw, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. If you have someone in mind you want us to cover, please let us know in the comments section below. Joe and I look forward to sharing more cinema history with you. Until next time everyone, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you again soon.